Right. Uh, next little video here focuses on climbs and descents, part of the key fundamental requirements for an aircraft. Um, obviously, as part of the departure process, the aircraft will take off, it will do its rolling process. Once it's got uh, sufficient speeds, it will very quickly start to climb and increase in altitude. Not uncommon for aircraft to reach the, the required altitudes, easy 20, 30, even 40,000 feet within a handful of minutes. Um, and obviously, this can be modelled using our aircraft three forces, uh, four forces rather. Right, so the four forces that we see in an aircraft are modelled on this diagram here. So I'm going to jump out of this into here just to get a quicker, better look at it. All right. Some key points worth mentioning before we start examining this diagram in a bit of detail here. When an aircraft is in steady level flight, so often abbreviated to SLUF, steady level. Then I break this down into a couple of words here. When accelerated, and then we've got flight. All right, some key concepts here. Steady level. If it's level, it means its altitude must be fixed. If the altitude is fixed, the aircraft clearly isn't climbing or descending in this case. So. The first assumption here is you can say the lift is equal to the weight or approximately equal to the weight for a short, short period of time. This unaccelerated part tells you that the aircraft is going forwards at a constant speed, hence acceleration naught. If the acceleration equals naught, we have the thrust going forwards, needs to balance out the drag from behind. Right. In typical flight then, in steady level unaccelerated flight, we will have the lift force going vertically up. There's our center of gravity of the aircraft. We have the weight going ver vertically down. These two vectors will be balanced, so they should be the same size technically. Um, Direction of motion, so we'll have the thrust. Pulling the backwards, we'll have the drag force. Right, and again, these two arrows should definitely be the same size with the same vector. Right. When Nekov starts to climb, and go over here, the first thing we should, need, we should start pointing out is there's our four forces thrust, lift, drag and weight. First off, the weight will always act vertically down. It will always follow the gravitational vector. The lift will always be 90 degrees or perpendicular to the drag force. That's typically 90 degrees there. Right, and usually that is nine. If we extend this relative airflow, the relative wind that comes in like that, it will be ninety degrees to the relative wind or the relative airflow. All right, the misconception with the lift is it's always an upwards force, as we'll see you a little bit later on. If the aircraft starts doing vertical maneuvers. And the lift force might sometimes not produce anything or might actually contribute to the work vector. Right, 90 degrees to the lift, we have the drag, as you can see here. And that is typically parallel to the relative winds. Here are the things that we can see in this diagram. We've got 
alpha, which is the typical definition of the angle of attack. Alpha T is the thrust angle. Is sometimes the thrust can be slightly offset to the drag. Finally, this Greek letter here, which is gamma, is used to represent the angle of climb or the angle of descent, depending on which way the aircraft's going. All right. In the diagram that we've got then, the aircraft's clearly climbing. It's got its nose above the horizon. What I'm going to do is just make a couple of extra vectors on this to help explain what's going on. So the lift force, if you notice, is slightly offset to the weight. And I'm going to extend this vector backwards with a dotted line just to hopefully see what we've got. Now there it is. Right, what this is saying is the lift force needs to be big enough to counteract the weight. And because we're no longer at 90 degrees, the lift force may need to be bigger than the weight in this case to help keep the aircraft afloat. Right, what we're going to do is find the relative component of the weight which is contributing to the lift or equal and opposite to the lift. So this bit is going to, this length here, it's going to be representation of the lift. And you get a 90 degree triangle to produce. Like that. And this weight that you can see here would technically be here. Right. Just help label this up. The angle that this lift vector is offset is the same as the angle of climb. So by definition, we get a gamma there. Right, and this is just going to use the Sokotoa. Right, so this side here, the weight is the hypotenuse, then this vector, which represents the lift component, will be relative to the adjacent side, adjacent in the angle. So we're going to take the cosine of it. This is now going to be the weight because of our climb angle. And you can see this length down here is opposite the angle, hence it's going to use a sine ratio. So W sine gamma. Right. Similarly, we can do something with the relative airflow. So if we extend that in. See it going through the drag. We can get another 90 degrees forming here. Let me just make that a bit bolder there. Uh, 90 degrees is there. This angle being alpha t, if you want to extend it in just to see it a bit more clearly. Therefore, this line here is our hypotenuse. Again, it's just going to use the sine and cosine ratios. Opposite the thrust angle is this side here. It's opposite is going to be the thrust sine or alpha t. And this length, which is the high point news, should be the cosine, so t cos alpha t. All right, whole purpose of that is if I stick the ruler on, you should be able to see Do this right. We're looking for forces which are parallel to the drag force. And as you can see here, we've got the drag force going in one direction parallel. If you start moving the ruler up and down, the first force you come across is this T cos alpha T. Right, so this is summing. I'm going to sum the forces between parallel 
to the airflow, so it's in the same direction as the airflow. We've clearly got, based on we're looking for things in this direction as the ruler, so you've got the thrust vector pushing the aircraft forwards, hence this is going to be positive. You can see we've got the drag going very, um, parallel to this. It's the full component. There's nothing to work out on that one. It's going backwards, though. And if we drag this ruler down, we'll have a component of weight, which would technically be this sign. It's not very well drawn, but. All right. And in terms of spec, this, you can see it's going down and left to match up, so minus. All right. What you're going to then do is do the same thing, but 90 degrees of this. Oh, very quickly. All right, 90 degrees. You can see we've got the lift force going vertically up. This is perpendicular to the airflow now, so it's 90 degrees to the airflow. And some of the forces perpendicular to the airflow. You've got the lift force going vertically up. We'll have a weight component, which you can see is this cosine of the gamma. Again, not particularly clearly drawn. It's pushing the aircraft down, and it's going to be negative. And lastly, if we drag this across, we'll have a component from the thrust, which is sine of alpha t. Again, this is going to push the aircraft forwards. All right, two key equations. All right, so those two equations should reappear here. So this is precisely what we just derived. Um, First thing we can say then is introduce some basic assumptions. All right, so when it comes to small angles, there's a couple of assumptions you can make for small angles. You can see here, if we've got the cosine of a small angle, it approximately equals one. Very easy to test that in the calculator. You've got the sign of a small angle, it equates to zero. All right. Typically, the thrust vector, if it's offset, it's going to be offset by, by a very, very, very small amount. So, first thing you can say is based on this assumption of small angles, we've got T, it's the cosine, so you can see it's going to be one. So, this just equates to one. That's the cosine of alpha t. We subtract the drag. And then sometimes, in, particularly in passenger aircrafts, where you don't want to disturb the passengers too much, you have a shallow angle climb. In that instance, sometimes this can be simplified. This is basically where the thrust equals the drag scenario comes from. So you can see by taking this sign of the angle to be small, in goes to zero, hence the weight component cancels out. This is the thrust equals the drag aspect. Similarly for the perpendicular, we're going to have the thrust times zero this time, plus the lift minus weight, and the cosine of the small angle is one. You can see that should correspond to lift equal in the weight. All right. Typically, it's very safe to assume that the thrust vector is offset by a very, very, very small amount. So this first assumption is fine. But sometimes the climb angle is what you want to work out. So we're going to leave that in here. All right.
There we are, right. So we're assuming the thrust vector is small. So that stays in. Based on the cosine of a small angle equal in one. You'll notice we've left the sine and the angles in. You so can actually work a few key points with respect to performance out here. In a balance climb, so this is the fact that the aircraft pitches up and it stays at that angle. We have a constant angle climb. We can assume these forces will equal zero. It will be balanced out. If it's unbalanced, then obviously the aircraft will start to climb again. It will pitch up or it will pitch down, depending on which of the forces is greater. All right, this first one. We're going to rearrange for the sign of the angle. That should just simply give us the thrust. Oh, it's a drag, it says it is, and divide through by the weight. All right, and lastly, the other one in a similar fashion, you can get lift, says it is, bring. Oh, no, no. Right, this will be quite a key equation a little bit later on. So you can take the work down. We'll see that again very shortly. All right, so these two equations are going to be very important in terms of working some key performance characteristics out, so we'll see it on the next slide here. So, first one, you can clearly see just by taking the sign inverse will give you the angle of climb. Okay, so we can take the sign inverse of plus minus and drag over the weight. That will give you the angle. All right. If it says up here, you take this rearrangement and you multiply it by the velocity, it gives you the rate of climb. All right. So you can see here. We multiply both left hand sides by velocity and the right hand sides by velocity. Now, if you think of the units involved here, we've got thrust and drag, which are newtons, weight, which is newtons, hence, obviously, they cancel out, letting you calculate an angle. This side, well, Velocity, typically meters per second, and multiply that by a thrust. Gives us a newton meter per second. All right, that is force times distance over time. Force times distance over time. That is the very basic fundamental formula for power. Uh, that becomes a little bit more important in, when we start to analyse the angle of climb shortly. Right, two curves are coming up. We're going to have one for the angle of climb, one for the rate of climb for thrust powered engines. This is a thrust powered engine. So, your jet engine, your turbofan, typically produces. Constant fixed amount of thrust if you put them on full. The thrust available will stay fixed. All right. If you look carefully, this bold line here, tracing over, says the thrust requires and it's following the drag curve. Now, see these. Rear lines, the zero lift drag and lift induced drag. You see, they clearly intersect at the minimum point. 
And the maximum climb angle that you can get for an aircraft is the maximum difference between the thrust available and the thrust required. So the greater you can make that difference there, the better, the steeper your angle of climb can be. And obviously it's pretty straightforward in that the biggest difference would be here, point of minimum. which corresponds to our question over here. What speed does the maximum angle climb occur for this particular aircraft? A little bit up for debate, but somewhere between 125 and 135 will be reasonable. I went for 140. Not a great graph to read. I can't emphasize if you look based on the curves, the thrust available stays constant, required is fixed. It follows the drag curve and at some particular point, we've got starting point. So this is the anything left of this will be the stall on point. And then there's a particular point where the thrust required to pitch the aircraft up is too great it won't be able to do it. So we hit what we call a ceiling. All right. For powered rated engine, so this is your turbo prop primarily, you can get very similar graphs. But rather than thrust available, it will, it will be power available. Now, just to avoid confusing things, this is for a turbo fan, this particular graph. And you use the thrust graph to work out the angle. The rate, so how fast are we increasing every second, lies on the power graph. And remember, power is just simply force times distance over time, or velocity multiplied by a force such as thrust and drag. All right, same principle. Maximum rate of climb is where the excess is at its maximum. A little bit harder to read. So we would have a stalling point. You know, a maximum point where you can't produce enough power for what you need. This distance here slowly starts to increase, 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 and then there's a maximum somewhere around there. Again, not the easiest graph to read this one, but your maximum diff distance based on my statement is about 220. We got here. But it doesn't seem too far out. All right. First example uses those graphs. The first graph shows, as I say, shows the thrust and drag available or requires. The second graph shows the power for the same aircraft. It asks you to determine the maximum climb angle and the maximum rate of climb for an aircraft which has a weight of 6,000 pounds. It's fairly straightforward to do in that uh, you're looking for this point here. Right, the thrust available, it's up for negotiation in terms of how you read this. Not the easiest one to read, but just by line of sight. The thrust available is roughly 1800. Take note of the units, this is pounds. On the bottom, We've got the weight, so this is our six thousand pound. Right, and the difference is this point here. So we're going to read this point off the graph. It's a little bit under five hundred. Probably go for about four hundred and fifty, maybe a bit more. Right, so. It's a case of sticking that in the calculator. And we will get our 
angle of climb out. Or the sign of the angle of climb is the inverse of that. All right, here we go. So sign minus one. 1800 minus 478 over 6000 should be again it's all about what you read about 12.8 degrees Right. The power, the only trick with the power is reading the axes because you need to be aware of the units, but the power gives the rate of climb. So that was the thrust multiplied by velocity to give the power available. The drag. In the power requires over the weights. So read some numbers off. We've got for the available. You're looking for at about this point here. Right, so that's looking somewhere just over 0 0.6. So it's 0.6. It's, if you read the axes, it says it's the power required in millions. So that's going to be 10 to the 6. You can subtract that required value, which is down here, and we're free about 0 0.2 area. Maybe a little, little bit more, so 0 0.24. Again, that's millions, so it's 10 to the 6. And you divide that by 6,000. All right, so answer comes out to that. And the rate of climb, or the maximum rate of climb, is 73.33 feet per second. It's feet because if the unit goes in there, there's your foot. Everything else cancels out. All right, that's basically it. So you're reading the graph at the point of maximum dust available and dust required. And for the rate of climb, the power available to power required at its maximum position. All right, that is the climb. The descent is very much the same. Only oh, this time the angle is negative. Obviously, the aircraft's heading down, so it's decreasing altitude. The example I'm going to go through this particular one is a glider, because as I said, the method's exactly the same, only one or two minor things to account for. But this one's a little bit different when there's a glider involved. So, when there's a glider, the aircraft is considered to have no thrust. The aircraft's clearly descending. There's our diagram. It's got three of the four forces in. We've got the lift, the drag, the weight. There's no thrust in this. And you can see I have labeled this weight vector into its lift component and its drag component. So the cosine accounts for the lift, the sine accounts for the drag. Right, and as you can, as you said before, that angle there would be the angle of descent, it would match this. Obviously, the heat force moves through the same angle as the aircraft moves. The other one is if you follow the Z angle across the horizon, 
down the dotted line, across the arc, we've got a Z angle, which indicates this one here should also be All right, what I'm going to do, just quickly jump out of this and to hold oh, point down here. Ooh. Right, just label them back on. Oh. If you consider the forces we've got then, similar to the method where I've got the ruler on, I can very quickly do this to show you. I'm going to sum the forces parallel to the airflow or the relative airflow, which will be down here now. We're going to have a negative drag force pushing the aircraft backwards. Force a weight vector pushing the aircraft forwards. All right, so that will be In that direction, so you can see roughly there's a drag force, there's a corresponding sign. You can rotate this 90 degrees. And we're almost there. Put it up against the lip force, which is 90 degrees to the drag force, so this is the perpendicular. So perpendicular to the airflow. You can see we have a lift force going up, a weight force going down, and it's the weight components in the same direction as the lift. So if you drag this out the way, because it's going down through the lift vector, it's this W because of the angle of descent. All right, there we are. So. Assuming the aircraft now is descending at a fixed angle, these two would sum to zero. All right, and just like before, you can rearrange them for the, the angle of descent in this case. So from the first one, we're going to go. Sign of the angle. Equals the drag, which gets brought to the other side, divided by the weight. In this bottom one, we bring that to the other side, so we've got the cosine equaling the lift divided by the weight. Right, first up then. We can introduce the third trigonometric ratio, which is the tan. And do that by taking the sine of the angle of descent, divided by the cosine of the angle of descent. Standard trigonometry says the sine divided by the cosine gives you the tan. What I'm going to do is introduce our definitions here. If the sine is a drag over the weight, And divide that by the cosine, which says the lift over the weight. All right. When you divide a fraction, left hand side says the same. We swap the sign in the middle to a multiplication and flip the other one over. So the weight now appears on top. The lift on the bottom, and if we cross cancel, we've got that word cancelling out that one, which therefore says the tan 
the angle of descent is the sine of the angle divided by the cosine of the angle, which is the drag to lift ratio. Right. The whole point of introducing the tan ratio is if we now go over here in this bit. You've got a triangle that looks like that, which says the altitude, the range, so how far you're dropping for how far you're going forwards is based on the tan of the angle. Right, so tan of the angle, opposite, the altitude, divided by the adjacent, which is the range. Right, so we can introduce that definition. Down here. So we get a new one which says H over R. All right. Very rarely do we have a drag to lift ratio on an aircraft. What we actually get is the lift to drag, which means you can see if we invert this one we will get lift to drag ratio. So we invert in this one, we have to invert everything else. Inverting not gives us one over the tan, which is the cosine over the sine, gives you the lift to drag ratio, which now says it's the range of the altitudes. Right, there's a few more to introduce. We're getting that. Uh, Let's rewrite that R over here. All right, lift is the lift equation. Drag being the drag equation. All right, we've got a half divided by a half. The density must match because it's the same aircraft you're applying this to. It would be traveling the same speed for the same wing area. So basically, we're converting the lift and drag forces into its coefficient form. And the final step worth pointing out one over tan, angle, cosine, and the sine. Uh, over here, right. This is CL. You can have conditions for CL, such as that at minimum drag. And quite often, an aircraft will have a drag polar which says CD is equal to CDO plus K CL squared. And obviously, CDO is a number, K is a number. Most common. Scenario up there, so we've got the lift drag ratio. The most common scenario for that says maximum endurance and so this is the concept that the aircraft can stay in the air for as long as possible. Maximum endurance will occur at the maximum drag ratio at which at that point we have CL, minimum drag, this is from the drag polis theory, the square root of zero lift drag over K. Right, and alternatively, you obviously you can get CD by plugging everything back into the drag polar, assuming you know CD on K, which you must work out CL anyway. 
You can get CD by putting number back in there or up minimum drag. This is only up minimum drag. CD is two times the CDO value. That's because this is the point of interception or zero or lifting, lifting juice. All right, quickly click back, catch ourselves up. Right. Quick example, just to finish all this theory off. So, for a glider, 500 kilograms at the drag polar, 0.012 plus 0.024 CL squared, and an area of 15 meters squared. So, it's determined the glide angle. The minimum glide angle, like right, the minimum glide angle. Is that maximum lift to drag ratio again? Or the point of minimum drag, as you can see there. So the minimum drag to lift or the maximum lift to drag. Based on this theory, you said CL being CD over K. You can plug the values in. Right, so this is instantly calculating both CL. Being the square root of CD over K. And you find the ratio, so CD. Is two times CD over, as we mentioned, right. Slotting all the numbers in. 0 0.012 divided by 0 0.024 all square root is will give you the CL value for this. Which is the square root of a half or root two over two. Just in case you want these numbers for reference. So CL is this, which comes out as root two over two, zero point seven zero seven. So you can see down here, CD twice CDO value, so that should be zero point zero two four for ACL. All right, so you get lift drag ratio from that. We invert it to get the drag to lift. Ratio, so this is the minimum drag to lift ratio by inverting it. So you've got a very small number, which we then need to take the tan inverse of. Often related to the tan of an angle, right? So, minimum glide angle, drag to lift ratio that we just got. See, small number, take the sine inverse of that, we get a very small angle out. So, a very, very slow descent here. For part B, the glider is at two kilometers. The maximum distance, so this goes to this diagram down here that's very badly drawn. We've got an altitude at 2 km. We now know this angle here is 1.95. It's just using the tan ratio to work out R. All right, point with this one is if you put in Two thousands, your answer comes out in meters. If you put in kilometers, your answer comes out in kilometers. Right, 
lastly, third example for this, looks at the F4 at an altitude. Right, this one deliberately because you're looking for speeds here. Maximum range, we have to operate at the point of minimum drag again. So it's the same theory as we've just seen in the last example. CD over K, CD over being twice. Sorry, CD being twice the CD over value. All right. Work out the two coefficients. And the rest of it is just lit formula rearranged. So true S piece is going to be the square root of two times the weight. This is assuming oh, for a small angle, you can take this, the small angle theory, two times the weight, the density, the area, CL. Right, so two times the weight, density at 18,000 feet. Has to be in slugs per feet cube because the units are given are all pounds and feet. Uh, the area is 530. Just got the CL slotted in. All right, and there we are. That should end that session for climbing and descending.